So just uh, 1 Corinthians, and I just titled it 1 Corinthians right now, our introduction, much like us. The 1 Corinthians church was a lot like us. There's a lot of things that they experienced, that we're experiencing, that we go through. And if we're not in the Word of God, and, and a lot of times we think, well, God has changed, times have changed. No, God's still the same. The same a lot of the same things the 1 Corinthians church would struggle with, we're struggling with. And so that if we want to maintain, have and maintain a right relationship with God, we got to allow the Word of God to speak to us. And so let's learn a couple things about this First Corinthian church. It was authored by Paul. Now, many of you know Paul was Saul. Saul was one that was persecuting the church. He was the Jew of Jews and felt like everything that the Christians were doing was blasphemous. And a lot of times there's people that you maybe come in contact with that feel like they got a religious superiority even over you and don't want to listen to what you're saying. But Paul was even an extremist in that. And he was seeking out Christians and killing Christians until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Some of the greatest miracles taking place throughout the world right now is Jesus supernaturally meeting people where they're at on the road to wherever they are, people in prisons. Some of the, there's, there's testimonies of Hamas leaders and, and Hezbollah leaders that, that have been in different situations where Jesus confronted them of their atrocities and they got saved and turned their lives over to Jesus. Go YouTube it, you'll see. People that you thought were unreachable, unsavable, that God's reaching into their lives and saving them. Paul, who was Saul at the time, was, was a lot of people would say was unsavable, was going to be a forever uh, uh, enemy of God. And so he, he gets saved. And then in about 55 A.D., and again, A.D. does not mean after death. It is, it's an abbreviation for Anno Domina, which is a, a Latin phrase, which means in the year of our Lord. And it refers to the year of Christ's birth. B.C., which means before Christ. Now, sometimes when you see dating things now in all your history books, if you went to school my time or later, you're probably going to see abbreviations like B.C.E., or CE. How many of you see that in your history books now, right? BC or CE. And BC means before common era, and CE means common era. And so all it's doing there is they're trying to take their, the Christian tone out of it. And so, I mean, you can still, CE can mean Christian era. How about that, right? If you still want to keep your our tone to it, right? And uh, I'm going to ask Christian, oh, actually, this one hasn't, Carlos, can I have this? Where is he? You, is he, you good? Okay. <laughs> Didn't look like you were working on it too much anyway, so here we go. Okay, so BC, before common era, you're going to see that in your history books. All they're doing is, like I said, trying to take the Christian overtone out of it. And um, so CE, common era. Um, let's go to the next slide. Then here, this, this Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, and Paul wrote while he was in Ephesus. We just got done doing our study in Ephesus. How many like that study in the Ephesians, right? That was a great study. We learned a lot. There was a lot that Paul was writing to the Ephesian church that we still have issues with. One of the greatest marriage seminars that we've ever done here was, was a love and respect conference. comes out of chapter 5 of Ephesians. There's so much in Ephesians. The five-fold ministry gifts comes out of Ephesians. While Paul was there, he wrote to the church in Corinth. It would be like if, if I was here and I wrote back to my church back in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin and said, hey, um, I'm getting word that this and this and this is happening over there and uh, you might want to you know, work on these are things that align properly with God's word. So there's churches where throughout uh, really Asia Minor, especially where Paul was influenced influencing all these churches because of his apostolic oversight. And here he's writing now to the Corinthian church because he was he was there. He wasn't necessarily, I don't know if you could say he planted the church because there was Christians there when he got there, but he was the one that was very influential in growing the church and helping them mature. How I many you know that we all need to mature? Amen? Amen? And if we don't allow the word of God to speak to us, sometimes we'll go down our same roads of immaturity and stay stuck there. How I many of you ever well, ran into Christians you've known 10 years ago and they're still up to, they're still walking the fence? They got one foot over here and one foot over there. Well, one day the fence is going to drop and something's going to happen, right? And so the reality of it is God wants all of us to mature. Let's get on to maturity with God. Paul even talks about the milk of some of them. that You're still on milk. What, what, have, you, what have you seen a 12-year-old still breastfeeding on their mom? What would you say? Hey, some of us are spiritual Christians like that. We need to grow up. Some of us really need to grow up. We need to get away to get, give up our old ways, and we need to get on to maturity. That looks foolish, right? 
You know, but when we're trying to live out a testimony for God and say, I'm a Christian, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, yet we're still, still at that infant stage. Let's grow. That's what we're meant to be. We're not meant to just grow in the world and, and, and acquire material things and raise a family. We're called to grow spiritually. We, want to, we need to be game changers in the kingdom of God. And so Paul is one that he's writing to the Corinthian church so they can grow up. He's writing to us here today. God, the Holy Spirit speaking to all of us here today so we can do what? Grow up. Right? And a lot of us say, well, wait a minute, I am. Don't, don't talk down to me. No, this ain't a matter of being talking down. This is a matter of, it's like sitting at the table at a buffet and you're getting the proper food so that you can get strong and healthy. Does that make sense here today? So Satan will try to make the Word of God seem like it's making you feel bad. It should make you feel good if you're really your spirit, is if you want to feed your spirit. Amen? Does that make sense? And so the commerce, uh, the, just the, well, Paul probably wrote while he was in Ephesus. Paul's first visit to Corinth, we think, was about 50 A.D., uh, the commerce there was a heavy trade. It was a port city, uh, meaning boats coming in and out. We'll take a little bit more look at that, uh, the geography of that. The culture there was primarily Greek, uh, worldly influence. Um, you know, if you look at it throughout history, it's kind of amazing. We're going to look at that in a second, too. But the Greek history and philosophy that from Alexander the Great, if any of you studied history, you studied Alexander the Great, right? He conquered more land and territory than, than almost anyone ever had. And his influence, every time he came in, he, he brought in a certain type of education. He brought in the arts. He brought in the, 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 um, the stadiums. Our Super Bowl that we just had, I don't know if that we wouldn't have had it. It wouldn't have been for Alexander the Great. I mean, you could, someone, you could almost argue that. Because one of the things that he brought in was, was the sports and the arenas. And, and uh, all throughout all those areas that he conquered, eventually they had the stadiums. A lot of you have been to Rome. Right? One of the th what's one of the things you usually visit? The Colosseum, right? And um, so this whole influence that, this, that came in because of the Greek culture, but then also the language. When the Bible was written in the New Testament, they, it was written in Koine Greek. You don't speak. That's not a language. They speak Greek in other parts of the country, some countries now, but not necessarily the Koine Greek. It was the most specific language maybe ever written. Which is amazing because now we can find with detail what is God speaking to us about. I know a lot of you like to argue you think uh, Jesus spoke in, in uh, King James. Oh, no, don't, don't believe that, okay? You ever been around someone? Oh, the King James Version is the only version. It's, uh, you, know, you thought Peter had it or something, you know? Uh, but really it was Koine Greek was the language that Jesus spoke in. The most specific language probably ever written. And then when we do our word studies and our Greek studies, when we're studying our Bible, we can get really detailed on what was, what was the real emphasis in that. But that's what we're learning in some of our Bible studies, right? And so the culture there, this is what, what Paul's writing to in the Corinthian church. Just think if you were in Corinth at that time, what would you be receiving? You're going to be receiving the same thing here that they received there. We're going to get the then and the there out of the Corinthians and then for the here and the now and how we need to live it out. Does that make sense here today? The Bible is written to us just as much as it was written to the Corinthians. You can say Corinthians, but how about the fountain of lifers? You know, this, this, this book is really written to the fountain of lifers. That's us. So when we take this book, we got to read and absorb it in a way that we allow it to change our lives. So we're no longer immature so that we're being grown up in Christ. Does that make sense here today? The religion of the, or the culture at that time, we said primarily Greek. The religion at that time was primarily pagan, uh, really Greek gods and temples. There was a lot of immorality because um, a lot of their religious worship was, was around sexual immorality. Um, Aphrodite was a, the, and the temple prostitutes there was uh, just a common thing. There was a theme uh, in Corinth. Um, have you gotten Corinthianized? And basically, have you been with a prostitute, or one of the temple prostitutes, or the Corinthian girl? Is another term uh, was known for the temple prostitutes. And so the immorality was just, it wasn't only part of the community. It was almost, if you were religious, it was almost a, a worldly religious part of it. But you think of what was the biggest thing, like, when we just had the Super Bowl here, what was one of the biggest things that they were that they were trying to uh, help stop from happening? Prostitution, right? Mm -hmm. See the similarities? Mm -hmm. 
So you have the, the you have the big stadium and everything going on and, and the games and stuff like that which seemed to come with the Greek culture and then also what came along with the Greek culture, immorality. Do you see that same spirit at work? You know, where the games and the culture is going on, you have the prostitution is almost right there, even though it isn't it isn't promoted that way, that if you want to become uh, you know, reach another spiritual level that you sleep with a prostitute, this is a whole different scheme. But the same spirit coming at people from a different angle. So people were out throughout the whole weeks and weeks and weeks and years ahead, uh, knowing that the Super Bowl was coming here, were trying to make efforts to stop the prostitution that was going to be taking place. But I don't know if you could read some of the accounts of some of the people that got arrested or stopped or saved in the course of this, but there was, there was like young, young girls that were actually, and I don't even know if it was young boys as well, that got rescued in attempts to be in bought and sold. It's amazing stuff. Um, but it's the same spirit that Satan has always done to try to steal, kill, and destroy. He's still about it. So let's go to the next slide. So here, I don't know how well you can see that, but this is a map. Uh, the orangish colors, that's kind of the Roman Empire. And where you add the red, the Roman Empire maxed out probably in about 117 AD and with Trajan as the emperor, but that was the influence that the Roman Empire had. But Paul, for the most part, he was working that perimeter that you see mostly there. He had a lot of influence um, in the church, especially. The primary, what we see in the book of Acts and, and in the New Testament, there, that what was recorded mostly was recorded in that, in, within that same Roman Empire that we see there. Now, Alexander the Great maybe conquered a little bit more than this, but it was very similar. And let's go to the next slide. So Corinth, there's an arrow down there where Corinth is. This probably doesn't help. You probably can't really see that real well. Uh, that's kind of today's world. Um, if you look up a little bit to the left, I don't even know if you can see Turkey up there. Um, then you can see where Athens is. Just a little bit to the left of Athens, Athens is where you would find Corinth. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Here's a little bit more of a red dot where Corinth is. And right where that dot is, there's a strip of land that's called the Isthmus. So what happened was is the boats, instead of going all the way around the bottom and getting around, uh, they would take and bring the boats up on land, and they had some kind of a, a, a system where they would try to carry the boats across that strip of land so they wouldn't have to go all the way around. But what happened is anytime you got a port city, anytime like Amsterdam, if you've ever been to Amsterdam, you got every nation under the sun passing through Amsterdam. Why? Because it's a hub for travel, right? And what ends up happening there, though, then you get a little of every culture coming in there. And so what happened in Corinth, not only did you have a little bit of every culture, but the, the biggest influences of the world were coming in there, and a lot of them weren't godly. But wherever, wherever there's opportunities to do things for God, Satan's going to be right there. So, but here, the, the positive side of that, if you're in Corinth and if you're a pastor or if you're a preacher or an evangelist, you start getting people saved, and they don't just pass them through the city. They take Jesus, what? back with them. I always think of the story, not, this is not necessarily the best way to look at it, but back in the day, uh, people used to um, take foxes and light uh, their tails on fire and pass them through uh, wheat fields to destroy things. And this, this again, that maybe isn't the best illustration, but um, sometimes the fire of heaven, you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit can pass when people get lit on fire and they take it back to their own countries and light them on fire in a good way, okay? Not in a bad way, but in a good way where you take people passing through Corinth, might be headed off to Italy or maybe headed off to, which is now modern-day Turkey or different parts of the world, that they're coming through in Corinth, but they're hearing the Word of God, and because it's a port city, now they can move and take it with them. I believe God's, some of you who have influence in other parts of the world or the country, that you can take Jesus back with you from wherever you are. So here's Corinth. That's its kind of position. Let's go to the next slide. That little strip there, there's a, um, there's a waterway. That's really what the modern day Corinth would look like. And instead, now they got a, like a canal. Like you've heard of the Panama Canal. That was the whole point of the Panama Canal. That ships wouldn't have to go all the way around. That they could just, uh, they cut a hole through there eventually. But because it was such a port city, they had all this, in, all this information coming through. Let's go to the next slide. Now, one of the things I want to just mention, too, about this a whole history thing, uh, back in Daniel, this is like 400 years before uh, even um, uh, maybe Alexander the Great, uh, he, the, he was, there was a prophecy about what was going to happen when, when he got through. I mean, Alexander the Great uh, 
He probably came through maybe from 331, and then Greece was all influential, influential until Rome took, uh, came and overtook the, that empire mostly in 164 BC, and then now you kind of have it split up uh, into the European kingdoms. But this illustration, so some of the things that we see in the dominance in the world, God had already pro prophesied it a long time ago. You already knew that you were going to be sitting here, even though he doesn't make you sit here, but he chooses, uh, or he gives you the option to, to know that there's, there's life in Christ and you can be here. But some of these things that he already prophesied, this is what's going to happen. Greece is going to, uh, first, I mean, at that time it was Babylon, and from Babylon it was going to be uh, the Middle P Persia uh, kingdom, and then after that it was going to be the uh, Alexander the Great, the Greek kingdom, and after that it was going to be the Roman kingdom, and after that it was going to be like the European kingdom. So God had already said, this is how things are going to play out. God's not late. In how, many, how many ever hear people say, well, God's outdated? God already knows the end. He already wrote the last chapter of the book. See, some of you in here get influenced by that. Some of you will say to you, well, God's outdated. He's no longer current. No, God wrote the last chapter of the book. All Satan is trying to do is put blinders on their eyes so they don't pay attention to God trying to love them into his kingdom. Because if God's out of date, then he might not know about what's going on with you today. He knows every detail of what's going on with you today. He knows every detail. He knows every thought. He knows every hair that's on your head or the absence of those hairs on your head. He knows all of it, right? Don't feel like God's out of touch. And you might say, well, then why does God let me go through what I go through? I promise you this. God is carrying you through some of the most difficult times in your life. Because sometime you're going to get onto the other side and you're going to say, wow, I'm amazed at where I am today. I'm in such a better place. I never knew it was going to be this good. So let's go to the next slide. I only showed you that statue to let you know that God already knows what's going to be happening down the road. And he's going to be there to help you get through it. Now let's go back to where the Corinthian church, where Paul first uh, ran into the Corinthian church. One of the things that we've told you before that if you go to any of the letters or the epistles of the New Testament, you can almost go into the book of Acts and you can see almost all the letters that be the beginning where Paul first made his entrance into any of these cities. In Acts chapter 18, this is where Paul went into the Corinthian church. And after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. He went where? To Corinth. He went where? To Corinth, right? There he met a Jew named Aquila and a native of uh, Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius, who was the Roman emperor between 41 and 54, had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went there to see them. And because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. How much time do we spend trying to persuade people? Or are we bought into the, the, the lie that, that, that um, it's, it's offensive to tell somebody that, that Christianity is the only way? How offensive is it going to be when people are falling off the cliff to eternity and to hell apart from Christ? That's going to be more offensive than us not saying something. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. But a lot of us have bought into it. You know what? Christianity is, a, you know, we've we, we got to let people believe what they're going to believe. Is that really, if we're really a Christian... And we really understand that Jesus died for us and he redeemed our soul. And we got to evaluate that statement. And we got to think about it. Because in reality, people are, again, walking off into eternity. And when they walk off the other edge of the edge of this life, they're either going to be brought up to heaven by the power of Christ, or they're going to drop off into hell on the other side. You might say, well, why are you talking? Jesus said that, right? These aren't my words. These are Jesus' words. We have no authority to rewrite Jesus' words. Would you agree? So how many people do you know right now that if it were, if, they don't, if things don't change for them and they don't come into a better understanding and accept Christ, they're going to be one of those dropping off the other side into hell. What are we doing to try to influence and help them understand that there's a God that loves them, that wants to redeem their life? we got to start seeing faces and minds of people, of lives of people. This is why we're here. If God redeemed our life, isn't it fair for us? Isn't it right for us to move on to the wood? God gave us the final command to make disciples of all nations, right? Don't just live your best materialistic life now. Don't get the, as nice a house as you can get, nicest cars you can get, and let everybody else just 
move off into eternity without Christ. That's not, that wasn't what God said. God said, make disciples of all nations. Why? The discipleship comes automatically, but not automatically, but it comes when you're in a loving relationship with Christ. Let's be the one that's going to help people get into that. We're, our time is running short. So Paul, he goes on to say, okay, so when it, did we get back, did we finish that last one? Yeah. Yeah, be reasonable with them every Saturday, Sunday, or every Sabbath. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, now remember who Silas was, right? Silas was one of Paul's traveling companions. Timothy as well at times. Timothy was a young person, it seemed like. Paul was raising him up. It was almost like he looked at him as his son, uh, but also his, his son in the Lord. And they came from Macedonia. Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching and testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook the clothes, uh, his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I'm clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the who? The Gentiles. Now, who are the Gentiles? Gentiles are just non-Jews, right? Most of us sitting here today are probably Gentiles, right? But Paul's, when initially, when God, uh, Jesus gave his command, he says, go from Jerusalem, Judea, uh, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And so, then Paul left the synagogue, went next door to the house of Titus Justice, a worshiper of God, and, and Crispus, the synagogue ruler for his entire household, believed the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. One night, that, that is amazing, that you got the synagogue ruler get saved. And synagogue, the, the, this was a whole Jewish, they were waiting for the Savior, they were waiting for the Messiah, the Savior to come. One of the things that, that I think why Paul was so, he was so on fire for the Lord when before he got, he thought he was, before he got saved, but all he had to do was reconcile the fact that Jesus was the Messiah that he was waiting for. Once he reconciled in his soul that Jesus, that Jesus revealed himself to say, I am the one that you were waiting for, Paul already knew all of that. Then all of a sudden, everything fell into place. He didn't ever hardly have to be taught anything by anybody because he already knew everything that the Messiah was supposed to fulfill. Once Jesus says, I'm he, Paul's like, okay, I get it. So then Paul was able to, and I believe that same is true for a lot of the Jewish people that were well-trained. They already knew what the Messiah was supposed to be. And so once this, like even here where you have a synagogue ruler, which was out of character for them to come to Christ, here they came, he came to Christ and his whole family, his household believed. That was a common trait back then. Whoever the, whatever the leader of the home did, the rest of the people in the family did. Can I tell you that's still important today? Amen. You know, if you're the leader of the home and you want your kids to be straight, yet we're still messing up, you know, I, I think as, as adults and leaders in our home, we got to be, we got to make sure that we're working on things and keeping things straight. Amen? Amen. But the other thing you got to remember, we all have a choice. So if you're raised right now in a situation where things aren't great, let Jesus be your guide. There are no excuses for anyone at any level. Amen? And so, then it says, goes on to say, the synagogue ruler who in his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard him believe and were baptized. One night when the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you, the one, no one is going to attack you and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed there for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. So Paul's in Corinth, right? So he's teaching. Well, again, you can go to the next one. It says, well, Gallo, Galito, okay, this guy we believe, from other records that we believe, he might have had a shortened time uh, as a proconsul, uh, but we figured probably this was about 51 AD. And he was a proconsul of Archaea. The Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court. This man they charged is persuading the people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak. Now here it is. Just think of them. They're trying to drag. You have different dynamics here. You have the Jews. They have their own interests, right? They're not the political leaders, but they have influence. Then you have the Roman, the Roman leaders, which uh, Gallio is one of them, right? And they're trying to, the Jews are trying to bring Paul into Galileo, right? And just say, hey, do something. This guy is... What did they say? Is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. 
Just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to the Jews, if you Jews are making a complaint about some uh, misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be unreasonable for me to listen to you. Okay, he said, hey, this ain't my issue. Okay, uh, but since it involves questions about words and names about your own law, Jewish law, right? Settle the matter among yourselves. I will not be a judge of such, such, such things. So they're having an issue with their religiosity, and, and uh, Galileo said, that's not me. I'm a, I'm a political leader here. Okay, I'm just supposed to maintain order in the city. So then they go, this, then they try this. And so, so he had them ejected from the court. Then they all turned on Sosthenes, the current synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the court. But Galileo showed no concern whatsoever. So they said, okay, if this was a domestic issue or this was a riot or some sort, maybe it's my issue. But because you're, you're having concerns about your religious questioning of, him, of what he's doing, I'm not, I'm not a religious judge. So what they do, they try to turn it into a political one by starting a, a riot. Okay, well then we'll start beating somebody up. Now you got to do something about it. But it then says that Galileo Gale, showed no concern whatsoever. So then Paul stayed out in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla's a good name. That's my mom's name. I don't know if that's where they got it from. I never asked her. But uh, <laughs> um, So this couple here were very instrumental in helping the church grow. How about your family? What if Paul came to Minneapolis? Would he be able to stay at your family at your family's house because you're you're very influential in in, in the in Christ being uh, spoke about in our community? I hope he would. I hope he'd be able to be you know know that you're right in the mix of things. Let's go to the next slide. So now when we're talking about the Corinthian church, so we went back to the Book of Acts to see how it kind of began. Paul's first introduction to the Corinthian church. And so when you read your Bibles, when you start reading the, the, the letters of the Bible, then you start seeing how they originated when you go back to the book of Acts, because Acts runs almost all of them uh, simultaneously, not simultaneously, but back to back, in how he visited all the churches. So what was the occasion for Paul writing to the Corinthians? He was responding to a report from Chloe's household. That'd be our household. <laughs> Actually, that's where we got the name Chloe from. We got the name Chloe from 1 Corinthians. Um, so some from her household, there was reports from others. Uh, it sounds like there was at least a letter or two that was circulated back to Paul that they were asking him to respond to some things. So every time when you got Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Titus, Timothy, Paul was always writing a letter. There's a reason for it. If someone writes you a letter, usually there's what? There's a reason, right? And because there's a reason, you want to get that... get through that letter, and understand what that is. Now, just as Paul wrote to the first Corinthian church, he wrote that to us. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. He wrote first Corinthians, wrote Corinthians to you and me. <laughs> and so the, the addressing, the, what is he addressing in this thing? In this letter, he's addressing immorality, he's addressing problems in the church, uh, orderly worship, uh, and the return of Christ. So there's obviously you could expand on that. We'll get into that as we get into the book, but this is going to touch every area of our lives. Are you guys ready to get into this? If we want to grow, if we want to mature, we got to want to get ready for we got to be ready to get into this. The theme is church order and Christian conduct. One of the things that our, our world really wants less and less, and this is Satan trying to devise this because he wants people to fall out of hey, you ever hear somebody say, and in a relationship, well, I just fell out of love. And I'm sorry, some of you maybe used that here. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Satan is trying to get people to fall out of love with God. He is. And he's using whatever he can in the world, in busyness, and different things, and moralities, and all these things, to get people to try to fall out of love with God. Because he knows, once you taste and see that the Lord is good, there's nothing else that can compare me and my wife have this conversation all the time. When we first got saved, and then once we got saved, we were just like, how could anybody not want to maintain their Christian life, their Christian walk? Yet, through all our year, I mean, we've both been saved over 30 years, we've come to realize that there's people, I remember when I first got saved, so the guy that was discipling me said, he said, Jim, don't be surprised if anybody that's around you right now ain't standing 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you got to be the one standing regardless. 
Your Christianity it can't be dependent upon anyone else. Amen. You have to stand. When no one else is standing, you got to stand with Jesus. This word is for everyone sitting here. I don't care how old you are or how young you are here today. You can't guarantee that that person sitting next to you isn't going to get off track. But I promise you today that if you stay and you maintain and you stay stronger than you stay standing with Jesus, your reward is going to be amazing in heaven. And so this theme of this letter of coming to the Corinthian church is, it's, it's, it's about church order and, and Christian conduct. This is timely for our church here today. And let's go to the next slide. So really the question I have, are we prepared to let the word spoken to the Corinthians speak to us? Are we ready for that? Are we ready for the church, the word spoken to the Corinthians, to be spoke to us? Let's all stand here today. I'm going to ask the praise and worship team to come back. We're going to open the altars for prayer time like we usually do. What I'm going to encourage you to do, some of you already are in the Bible study that we're doing in Corinthians. So we're already breaking it down on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And Sundays we're going to break it down in just a little bit of a twist and a little bit of a format. A little different uh, angle on it. How many of you know God wants us all to grow and mature, right? If you go back to the, uh, I think, third slide, second or third slide. The one with the, our theme for the year. There you go. This is what God's trying to do. Because in the Corinthian church, in chapter 13, Paul goes, he gets into faith, hope, and love. You remember him saying that? But the greatest of these is what? Is love, right? You see that at almost every wedding. But Christian community means that we come together. That we don't avoid coming together. That we don't make it easy to, to avoid this growth process that God's trying to bring us all through. How I many you know that God's got a plan for us all, but we need to come together to grow. Amen?